Coming up on DTNS, why Amazon suspended its contract with Parler, Panasonic's heads-up display for your car that seems actually useful, and Richard Gunther brings the smarts on smart homes. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, January 13th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Frog Pants Central, I'm in Salt Lake City. I'm Scott Johnson. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And as I mentioned, Richard Gunther from the Digital Media Zone joining us. Richard, good to have you, man. Good to be here. And I am calling in from the Outer Banks, North Carolina this week. Wow, look at that. So we're spanning the continent. Uh, while all of us are at CES, technically. <laughs> sure. Because, as we've yeah. been saying all week, the we're real CES there. It's in is our hearts. inside of us. Yeah. Uh, we were just talking about home improvement and uh, strategies for dealing with garbage disposals. Get that wider conversation on our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Intel announced that CEO Bob Swan will step down effective February 15th after two years on the job. Pat Gelsinger, CEO of VMware and former Intel CTO, will take over as CEO of Intel. Intel Executive Chairman Omar Ishrak said that Gelsinger will lead Intel's transformation from being a CPU company to a company that makes multiple kinds of architectures. Bob Swan was previously CFO of Intel and his expertise lied in finance, not engineering. In December, Dan Loeb's Third Point Hedge Fund had encouraged Intel's board to explore alternatives. Please send us screen captures of every story that titles this swan song. YouTube removed a video from the president's campaign YouTube channel for violating policies it did not name. The channel will be prevented from uploading new comments, or uploading new videos for a minimum of seven days, which would end January 19th. Comments on all videos on the channel have been turned off indefinitely. AMD will begin selling Threadripper Pro CPUs directly to consumers starting in March. Previously, they were only available in machines like the ThinkStation. The Pro line of Threadripper doubles memory channels to 8, doubles PCIe lanes to 128, and increases memory capacity from 156 gigabytes to 2 terabytes. Beneficial for users that work with large data sets or need multiple graphics or networking cards. Anontech reports three motherboards will be coming that support Threadripper Pro. Mm, that's good. That's good news for, for builders. In a presentation at CES, Samsung LSI president and GM, Dr. Inyup Kang, announced, we are working together with AMD and we'll have a next generation mobile GPU in the next flagship product. Now, Samsung LSI makes the Exynos chip and Exynos was just announced. So when he says next generation mobile in the next flagship product, that probably means the Exynos that will come out next year, but we'll keep an eye on that. TikTok has made accounts for registered users between the ages of 13 and 15 private by default. This limits viewing and commenting on content, on content with approved followers and turns off the suggest your account to others option. Downloads of content will also be disabled entirely for these groups with downloads set to off for 16 to 17 year old users, although those users can change that setting if they so desire. 13 through 15, can't. TikTok's video collaboration feature Duet and remixing feature Stitch will also be limited to users 16 and up and set to friends only as default. MSI announced a line of portable gaming laptops using the NVIDIA RTX 30 series GPUs we talked about yesterday. Uh, thanks to the new chips, the MSGS66 will be able to run games in 4K. The GS66 Stealth is up for pre-order now, shipping February 2nd, starting at $1,799. MSI also added new thinner models to its mid-range GP Leopard line. That's coming February 5th. And if you like thin, the Stealth 15M is 16 millimeters thick. Don't cut your finger on it. Uh, MSI says make it, it makes it the thinnest gaming laptop yet. 15M also is using the Intel 11th Gen H series, uh, along with the NVIDIA chips, shipping March 8th, starting at $1,399. Amazon announced it will launch a mobile-only Prime video subscription in India for 89 rupees per month. The company is launching the plan in partnership with mobile carrier Bot. Barty Airtel, initially available only to prepaid customers, with customers getting an additional six gigabytes of data as part of the subscription. You might say, well, that's not very much, but there are some limitations. Amazon is expected to offer the subscriptions with other mobile carriers soon, but for now, it will be limited to one stream at a time and delivered in standard DEF. 
This is Amazon's first standalone video subscription offering, but it's not the first. Netflix has offered a mobile-only subscription in India since July of 2019. AMD told The Verge it will feel uh, more of its reference design RX 6800, 6800 XT, and RX 6900 XT cards directly uh, from its own website at sticker price to as many gamers as possible. So they're going to they're gonna sell them directly. NVIDIA announced its GPU supplies will remain lean through Q1, which for NVIDIA ends in late April. NVIDIA says demand for the RTX 30 series is twice what it was for the RTX 20 series, and that's the problem. NVIDIA says if it notices crypto miners' demand affecting orders, it will reintroduce the CMP product that is tailored for mining uses, but it doesn't believe that segment is affecting the supplies right now. Meanwhile, U.S. tariffs on Chinese goods are kicking in, raising prices on what little cards are available in the U.S. Uh, EVGA, Zotac, and Asus have all raise, raised their prices. Speaking of Asus, the company announced the Chromebook CX9 that runs on Intel's 11th Gen Core i7, supports Wi-Fi 6, Thunderbolt 4, and HDMI Titan C security, and meets the MIL STD 810H U.S. military standard for durability. No prize, but it is coming to North America in Q2 of this year. New versions of the Asus ZenBook Duo 14 and Pro Duo 15 OLED now angle the second screen up to be easier to use, see better. Software updates will also let you flick apps between the two screens and create specialized patterns of shortcuts, palettes even. The ZenBook Duo 14 ships this month and the Duo 15 OLED ships in April. Asus also announced more monitors with HDMI 2.1 support. And Asus also announced the ZenBeam Latte projector. You might say, what is it called that? The fabric covered TV projector is the size of a large cup of coffee. That's the projector itself. It actually projects way bigger. It's meant to be moved from room to room and can project from 40 to 120 inches with 300 LED lumens of brightness coming in North America in Q2, although no price. Yeah, we should clarify too, you can project more than just pictures of lattes. Uh, it can project any. any right, or, or just very large ones. <laughs> yes, yeah, up to uh, a very, <laughs> you know, 65 inches. Just a lot of coffee. All right, I'm just putting off uh, talking about Amazon's response to Parler. Amazon filed a response to Parler's lawsuit alleging antitrust and breach of contract, saying it reported to Parler over many weeks more than 100 examples of content that encouraged violence. The filing quoted 15 examples of such posts. So a lot of folks have been saying, okay, Amazon says they violated the terms. What's the evidence that they did? Amazon is now filing that evidence as part of the lawsuit. Uh, I want to warn you that you may not like hearing some of these examples, and I'm not going to read all of them, but I think it's important to hear some of those examples if you're not going to go look them up yourself. Uh, examples include Jack Dorsey, you will die a bloody death. We are going to fight a civil war on January 20th for militias now and acquire targets. On January 20th, we need to start systematically assassinating liberal leaders. Shoot the police that protect these senators right in the head. After the firing squads are done with politicians, the teachers are next. Those are the kinds of posts that Amazon was objecting to that they say Parler did not take down. Uh, there were others that were targeting Jewish and black people using racial epithets that I won't repeat here. Amazon clarified in its filing that it has suspended service, not terminated it, and is open to restoring service to Parler if the company's moderation policies come into compliance with AWS terms of service. Uh, we talk about it because I think it's important to know, uh, and, and I was wondering, okay, how bad was it? W what were they actually objecting to? And this gives us uh, a, a representative sample of what they say they were objecting to. Yeah, uh, just I would, the only thing I would say about this is um, them showing examples and saying how long it took, and here are examples of what we said they didn't take down, and and that sort of thing is really, I think, healthy for what is otherwise a very uh, free market move on the part of Amazon or anyone else deciding to do this. And I think it strikes me as extremely reasonable and totally the way this stuff should go. So maybe you don't have hideous, horrible stuff on your site or your app, and maybe you won't get pulled from places like Amazon. To me, it's like simple math, like two plus two here. And I like that they are being you know, somewhat transparent about their reasons for reacting the way they did. That's important to me anyway. Yeah, I, I think it. I think it's uh, it's something that I don't want to pass off. Uh, that it is it is a big deal to tell a company we're no longer going to support you. Uh, and so I'm glad that Amazon 
has given me or given the courts, but by giving the courts now I get to see a little bit more of why they decided to take this this move. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you about a couple of doorbell announcements. You got people at your door. Good news, everyone. A couple <laughs> of doorbell announcements to mention. Ring announced its doorbells and security cameras will start rolling out end to end encryption to users in an opt in basis today. As of today, that's right. Uh, Ring videos uh, are already encrypted, but the addition of end-to-end -end means only the customer can view them, not Ring. That's a huge change. Arlo announced its own version of touchless doorbell, uh, similar to the, uh, the one you guys mentioned uh, earlier in the week from Alarm.com. Arlo's version doesn't use a welcome mat, though. Instead, the doorbell just detects when a person is close to the doorbell and rings a chime and shines a light so the person at your door knows the doorbell has already been rung. The Verge's uh, Sean Hollister asked the question of whether existing doorbells that already have cameras and speakers should get a software upgrade to do similar things. Uh, I don't know if I want a door. I, I love the <laughs> idea of contactless ringing, but I don't want a door just saying, hey, we think you're there, bing bong. I don't know. Yeah, Tom was saying the same thing earlier. He's like, oh, the dog's going to be barking. It's a whole thing. Uh, I, at the same time, there are so many security gadgets that, you know, act as a camera or, you know, just, you know, just let, let, letting you know if someone's prowling around on your front stoop type thing that can kind of work the same way. Yeah, I don't want my doorbell to ring anytime, I don't know, a raccoon comes sniffing around, but I might want a notification on my phone that's a little bit less intrusive. I mean, it, it, we're, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, the whole idea of like, oh, okay, instead of having to touch a doorbell, which is like yucky and dirty and no one wants to do things like that anymore, you stand on a, a mat and everyone knows that you're there. There are kind of other ways to do that already. So this seems a little bit like clever doorbell marketing, but it will work in certain scenarios. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, you talk about this being possible today and, and Hollister asking the question, why couldn't this just be a firmware update? Many of the products, Ring's products in particular, can already do this. Ring's products can detect whether it's a person or whether it's not a person. And if it's a person, it can send you a notification that there's somebody there, just uh, enough to let you know that there's somebody at the door without them even ringing it. Now, it doesn't necessarily give them any indication that the doorbell has been triggered, but I'm not convinced that these mechanisms these companies are trying are going to effectively communicate that to people anyway. This is a new interaction model, and it may confuse a lot of people. So I, I like the idea of just using your devices with the notifications that you want. I'm not convinced it's going to stop anybody from sticking their finger out and pushing that doorbell anyway. As Sarah said, I don't want this because, you know, the garbage truck went by and set off the motion detector on my doorbell earlier, and I, I don't want that to <laughs> ring the doorbell. Uh, maybe it'll be better than that. Uh, but if you this is a use case where you're like, no, I, I'd be fine with that. If anyone gets close close enough to my door to set off the motion sensor, I would like it to ring, uh, and, and that's fine. Then, yeah, I, I don't know why you wouldn't do it as a firmware upgrade uh, and make it optional. Don't don't push it on, on anybody. Uh, that's just a couple of the things we're seeing. Richard, uh, what are some other home automation products that you noticed during the CES announcements? Yeah, at CES, I think we're seeing something that is a pretty common theme that a lot of people expected, that this year is gonna be another year of evolution in the smart home. Last year was thrown a little bit of a curveball because of COVID, and so you saw things where like cameras didn't sell as well, but home devices did, things for entertainment and exercise and stuff like that. So I think this year, between the changes of life at home and things we're seeing happening in the market, like standardization around this project chip, connected home over IP, which is all the big players like Apple and Google and Microsoft and everybody deciding that they're gonna play together and figure out how to make their stuff work together. Companies are trying to figure out how to support that, but at the same time, then they don't wanna be commoditized. So they're trying to figure out how to differentiate. So you see companies like Sync, formerly known as C by GE, adding things like cameras and fan controls, trying to be your ecosystem, go to their app, even though it'll all work together. Mm -hmm. So a lot of consolidation, and that's true even in the, uh, just in terms of mergers and acquisitions. Just in the last two weeks, we already saw the announcement of Weber acquiring the company that makes June Oven, 
interesting because I have a June oven shipping any day now. So I'm curious to see how much that gets supported going forward. Uh, Allegiant okay. just announced that they're buying the IoT services company You Know Me. So a, a lot of changes this year as the industry kind of gets itself together and in prep for a more standardized ecosystem. What about uh, other uh, other devices in the in the home? I mean, we talked about doorbells, but uh, we, we we've you know seen a couple of the Kohler things this week. What what has caught your eye there? Yeah, exactly. Touchless everything, right? You don't have to touch anything anymore. So <laughs> Kohler has things like uh, t bathroom fixtures that you don't have to touch to flush your toilet or to turn on the spigot. Supposedly they work better than the fixtures that you find at your nearby airport that none of us miss right now. Uh, the ability to turn your shower on without touching it, I'm not quite sure what benefit that has because you probably know the people that are showering in the same space that you're using. But whatever, these types of things are making more uh, appearances around the home. LG has put out a a uh, prototype for a refrigerator that will open by voice command so you don't have to touch the door. That's actually kind of handy because I don't know how many times I've had to touch the handle of the door with meat hands. You don't want to do that. Mm. That's just nasty. Yeah. So we are seeing changes like that. And I think in terms of stuff for the home, we're going to see the introduction of more products that make life around home easier since you're spending more time there. Uh, robotic vacuums, a lot of interesting innovations there this year new entertainment devices, uh, things that are just going to make your time at home more interesting, and appliances that can make day-to-day -day activities a little bit easier. Of course, my favorite of all of these, way out of touch for now, but in the future someday, that, uh, that Samsung robot handy that's going to load my dishwasher properly for me, I'm all about that. <laughs> yeah. There were a lot more robots. There's always robots at CES, but I felt like there were a lot more uh, this year. None of them seem like the ones that's really going to become a mass hit, uh, but there, there's more shots being taken, if you will. Yep, absolutely. I will say, Richard, as for that touchless turn on the shower thing, uh, my shower because there's it's a it's a you know it's a it can be docked but it can also be handheld you know mm. when the water comes out it sometimes just for reasons unknown to me will kind of move since the last time I was in there and I can't tell you how many times I turn on the shower and I'm blasted now if the shower door had been closed and I was able to just be like turn on the shower at however many degrees it would save me uh, a fright uh, you know 50% of the time in the morning so it. Might be a specific use case, but one of those things. I like the idea. I just don't yeah. know how much that's going to cost. Yeah, well, exactly, which is why I'm not buying one. <laughs> uh, moving on, Airbnb has canceled all reservations and is blocking the ability to make new reservations for the Washington, D.C. area next week during the U.S. presidential inauguration. This applies to reservations made through Airbnb's Hotel Tonight website as well. Airbnb owns Hotel Tonight. Guests will receive full refunds, and Airbnb hosts will also receive the money that they would have received if the reservations had not been canceled. So nobody really loses here. It's just that the stay can't happen. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser, Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, and Virginia Governor Ralph Northam had made a joint statement encouraging people not to travel to Washington, D.C. next week at all. So it's a move by the company that at first I, as an Airbnb host who's had some challenges, all COVID related over the last almost year now, um, I, you know, first I was like, ooh, this is going to be a real big problem because there's going to be an issue where guests get the refund, right? Because they're encouraging people not to travel, but there's also airline tickets or all sorts of other means to perhaps go a long way to get there. And Airbnb is not going to cover any of that stuff. And the host getting the money is also, that's new because even for COVID reasons, there have been many situations where in California, where I live, and the specific county where I live and am a property manager inside, there were certain situations where they're like, well, the people can't travel because we don't want anybody to travel to the area and get sick or infect others. But you as a host don't get anything back. You just kind of have to deal with the um, to the repercussions. I assume that Airbnb is willing to eat this money because we're talking about a short amount of time, you know, a week, right? A week plus rather than, you know, 
a year plus. Also, it's voluntary. With what Airbnb can say with with uh, Sonoma County is uh, not our fault. So you know they 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 have to cancel, but we don't have we don't have to make you good. Whereas here they're saying it's a it's an encouragement. It's not a it's not a legal thing. You're not it's not illegal to travel to Washington D.C. So right, we're right. just going to try to be. We're making a decision to do this, and 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 because we're making the decision that we wouldn't have to, we'll give you that. We'll make you whole and let you keep that money. That that makes sense to me. Yep. I think it'll be interesting to see what the hotels do here, right? We don't know what Marriott, Hilton, IGH, and the other major chains are going to do next week, and uh, you know <laughs> their history and their intent obviously as a business is to make money. So this would be a big loss for any chain that kind of put that flag in the ground. Yeah. They and, already uh, had an announcement from, from Marriott about funding and stuff, but they haven't said anything about, you know, actual day-to-day -day operations changing during an event like this. And so uh, you're right. That's like a really thin line for them to walk. Um, and, you know, I guess they still have time to say, Hey, we're, shutting down these three hotels in the downtown DC area or whatever they're, you know, whatever is possible. Um, they could still do that, but I have a feeling probably not. I think Airbnb is in a unique, a more unique position for this because that business model is just a little different and isn't the right. same as a day-to-day -day sort of multi-story hotel type right. situation with a restaurant in the basement. Yep. So, yeah. Well, and, and the hotels have already been on low capacity because of COVID anyway. So, you know, uh, right. It's it well, it's and there's hard, security hard. in place, not at every hotel, but at mm -hmm. major hotels that that sort of thing is is part of the deal. You know, when you're checking into somebody's house and you're finding a key in a lockbox somewhere and you don't really know where you are and and it's that it's a little bit different. I think Airbnb is doing the right thing here, but with in my experience with the company, sometimes these things are not as seamless as as they seem. Well, and I wonder because of what you said about people who have already bought plane tickets or whatever, and they're not they're coming for the inauguration. They're coming to visit their aunt Tilly or or whatever. Right. Uh, how many of them are going to try to directly reach out to the Airbnb host and say, "Look, I know Airbnb canceled my reservation, but could I still stay there anyway?" And we can just you know put it under the table. Um, there's nothing Airbnb can do about that. Uh, no, and, and there would be no way to police all of that stuff. There's just, there's just, it's just too big of a network. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if that sort of thing happens, then then you're in another world of hurt, um, liability wise. All right, folks, uh, if you've got thoughts about this or any of our stories, join in the conversation on our Discord, which you can do by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. GoPro released a number of new experimental camera features under the GoPro Labs site. Features include motion triggers, which will start recording when it detects that the camera is moving. That way, when you're sitting there stationary trying to figure out what you want to record, you're not wasting your battery. Uh, USB power triggers that start recording when power is detected over USB. Good for, like, starting things up when you plug it in, but also uh, GoPro points out that this could be used for dash cam uses, where when you start your car, the power goes to the USB, the GoPro wakes itself up. Uh, also, uh, timed expose locks, simpler live streaming QR code integration, uh, bringing motion detection to all video modes. Features can be tested on the Hero 9 Black, the Hero 8 Black, the Hero 7 Black, and the GoPro Max. Uh, kind of excited about this, because it feels like I'm actually a little annoyed I didn't make this prediction in our prediction show because <laughs> it feels like that company and companies like it where their main focus has been, are you a snowboarder? You want to mount this on your head and blow our minds? <laughs> like just that kind of that model <laughs> is less of a, it's going to be less and less of a, of a return for them. And they need to figure out ways to do more with that brand. And I'm telling you, there's money on the table for like streaming stuff and, uh, you know, some kind of webcam approach with a GoPro because the quality of those things is amazing. The price isn't that bad for what you're going to get. And there's just a lot of other uses that right now they're just not great at. So them diversifying in this way is not that surprising, but also a welcome thing as far as I'm concerned as someone who, you know, digs that kind of stuff and wants to buy new cameras next year. Agreed. And I'm very happy to see that it's going back to the version that I have, the Hero 7 Black. There you go. That's a good one. <laughs> you remember the old ones where they didn't even have they didn't even have a screen on those things. You remember? Oh, that? Yeah, I've got one of those. Those were terrible <laughs> days. Those are days I don't want to think about anymore. But 
<laughs> we're in a, we're in a new place now. Yeah, like fun. what are you recording? Hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fun of it. You'll find yeah, out right. later. It, it was like, like old... a throwback to film days. We had to yeah. wait a week for right. your film to get developed. It's terrible. Right. Anyway, uh, let's move on. Panasonic is in the news. They showed off its heads-up display for cars, which goes well beyond the typical speed and temperature. Uh, the demo laid out a blue line on the road to show where to navigate your car. Identified a bicyclist that was merging, indicated a height of a bridge that you're about to go under. Uh, also, all the time showing you how long your destination is and how far until your next turn. Oh, and your speed. That's in there, of course. Panasonic says the system updates every 300 milliseconds and eye tracking keeps the information lined up. Uh, Panasonic says the system is compact enough to work in most vehicles. And Sarah, you were saying before the show today that you have some form of this, but it sounds like this is a big jump ahead of what you're doing. Yeah, it's given me more options than I have. I've got a Volvo. I've got a heads-up display. It was kind of, you know, part of the package of, of the car that I got, and I love it. It's great. Uh, it does not have eye tracking. So if, you know, when you when when I first figured out, okay, this is how I want to sit, you know, you figure out the heads-up display so that it's exactly right and it'll show up, and, you know, there's not a lot of room for error. So if I'm like, oh, I want to kind of chill on my next ride, it's going to go away unless I uh, redo the whole thing. It's also pretty limited. There is some customization, but it's mostly speed limit. Uh, if it thinks I'm too close to the car in front of me, I'll get a little sort of like collision warning type thing. And then it'll sort of flash like if I'm in a school zone, which is actually really helpful. Sometimes I'm like, oh gosh, I need to slow way down. You know, I wasn't paying attention. But uh, for something like bicyclist merging, um, certainly a, hey, car might be drifting a little bit, blue line, super helpful. Uh, height of a bridge, not really putting a lot of stuff on top of my car, but if I did, that might be really helpful on road trips. It's nice be to be stuff. able, to, yeah, yeah, it's nice to be able to just have certain options, as long as, of course, the heads-up display isn't so littered with stuff that you're looking at it more than you're actually looking outside the window in front of you. I love this. Yeah, that, that's why, why this was so impressive to me is this looks like things I need to see. Right. Mm -hmm. Instead of blocking something, it's pointing out like that's a bicyclist. You might not notice that's a bicyclist, but now you will because you can see it. We're, we're highlighting it. Uh, here's the blue line that tells you where the road is. So you don't have to be looking down at a phone that's on a little thing that's going to fall off your vent. Uh, it's just right in your line of vision and you'll know, oh, there's my turn coming up. I see the blue line turns right up there. Great. Uh, it, the, the navigation alone makes this worth it. And for the first time, heads up display looks like something I could use rather than something that I think is kind of neat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As you, you made a really good point about the not having to look down at a phone that's hanging on by a ledge or hanging on by a clip <laughs> or whatever, because I know that's dangerous as much as we're getting a lot of good voice feedback these days. And it's saying when to turn and it's kind of keeping you ahead in a busy traffic filled city still not great. So something where I didn't have to take my eyes off the road, I'm seeing it as integrated into the world. Like that's absolutely the, where we want to be. Uh, well, you might also want to be with Ubisoft who announced Wednesday that it's Swedish massive entertainment studio is collaborating with Lucasfilm game, Lucasfilm games on an open world, original story game set in the star Wars universe. Mm -hmm. The game will use the Snowdrop engine also used in Tom Clancy's the division electronic arts has an exclusivity deal for star Wars games that expires in 2023, but EA says it will continue to develop star Wars games non-exclusively. Lucasfilm Games also announced Tuesday that an Indiana Jones game is in development with Machine Games. Scott, I have a hunch you're excited about this. We're very excited about this as a, as the gaming community. I'll be the, their spokesman for the moment. Uh, it's exciting stuff. Machine Games known for their work on the Wolfenstein uh, recent games. Those are excellent first-person shooters. This doesn't indicate whether that Indiana Jones game would be first-person or not. But back to the open-world Star Wars stuff. There's been a little bit of stagnation with Star Wars licensed stuff since Disney got a hold of all the licenses. They stopped their own internal studios. Disney's interactive went away. Um, and they moved everything to EA, or they made deals with EA for most of their exclusive licensing to Star Wars games. They had a couple of hits in there, a couple of big bombs, some very controversial stuff with Battlefront and microtransactions and, and that sort of thing. Um, was all at the forefront of that mess. So it's been kind of an ugly period or an adjustment period. And what it sounds like now, they're 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 basically saying, all right, look, we've got the we've got the Lucas Games banner back. It's here. 
and that has a lot of cachet, a lot of history behind it, uh, even outside of Star Wars related stuff. And we've got Ubisoft, who makes really great, maybe some of the industry's best open world games. Their open world style is very well known and respected. Um, and the Division Two, while not not that kind of open world game, uh, there's real prowess to that, and I think that that's the right team. Um, and given that, when all the other resources they have at Ubisoft, they, sh they should be able to make a really killer open world game, which is my favorite kind of game. So I'm beyond excited about an open world Star Wars game uh, made by a, a big studio like this. And it's nice to see them spread it around a little bit, not be so exclusive to EA. If I'm honest. Yeah. A simpler yeah. game for a more civilized age. <laughs> I mean, really, it's it's a chance to, for, for those, maybe there's some at home going, wait, open world, what does that even mean? Think Grand Theft Auto without all the crime, but Grand Theft Auto is a, is a good example of an open Let's world go. game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, more, more, more comparable would be something like a, a modern Assassin's Creed game, which Ubisoft makes. Mm -hmm. Those are big, expansive, uh, detailed, incredibly rich visually worlds uh, with lots of story, lots of side quests, tons of stuff to do, huge maps. Imagine that in the Star Wars universe and you're getting close to why I'm so excited. So it's going to be great, I hope. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. So for everything that's announced at CES, <laughs> there's always someone saying, wait, that sounds really expensive. I have something that's <laughs> cheaper and does the same thing. And Brendan had that exact note on the $3,000 smart doggy door that we talked about earlier this week. He says, maybe I'm missing something, but the dog door announced at CES sounds very similar to the door I've been using for a year. It's been incredible. It's the pet safe electronic smart door, collar activated. It's for dogs and cats. Comes to in two sizes for smaller or larger pets. Brendan says $150 versus $3,000. If I wanted to make it smart, I could add a home kit sensor to it. Sure, I'd love some features built in or for it to use AC power instead of recharging D batteries, but otherwise it's perfect. Yeah, uh, it's a fair question, uh, Brendan. Uh, I sent Brendan this Verge article uh, that goes into detail of what Chamberlain did to make the MyQ pet portal. I still agree with Brendan that $3,000 is way too expensive. But to be fair to Chamberlain, there's more to it than there is in the PetSafe electronic smart door, which looks like a great door and, and way more affordable. Uh, there's 1080p cameras that let you remotely monitor so that the pet can ask to be let out without you being in the same room. It's encrypted video uh, available worldwide through Amazon S3, so it's just you uh, looking at it. Uh, it logs when your pet goes in and out. There's infrared and touch sensors to avoid the door closing on the pet, Bluetooth LE collar, uh, so the pet can ask to be let out by sitting. You, so you can train it to sit. Uh, it doesn't just uh, detect any approach. It, it has to show that it really wants to go out. Uh, built to look seamless, that's one of the big things. You don't know the door is there. It's built for insulation, so it won't allow drafts. Built for security, it's difficult to break into. You have to have a pro install this, so it's easy to install because you don't do it. And it's a whole <laughs> door. Uh, that's the other thing. Like, you're not just buying a thing and having to put it in the door yourself. You're paying $3,000 for someone to come and replace your door that has the MyQ door in it. So right. maybe we did it a disservice by not explaining all this. I am still understand where Brendan's coming from, where it's like, sure, okay, that's great if you got $3,000, but I'll go with my $150 version. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it is a people door, but at $3,000, it's still really expensive for a custom people door installed <laughs> and it's a people I, I, I would argue that that the some of the parts still probably don't equal 3k also i'm not entirely sure i really want chamberlain deciding what door decor i'm gonna have in my home <laughs> that's not you know i'm thinking anderson or something like that that There's, would these have are made all sense fair here. questions yes absolutely <laughs> I love we're like for three thousand dollars it needs to look different. Darn it, works really well. But they do give you three choices. There's a wood wood yeah. choice that's even more expensive than they, the fiber class. They <laughs> all look pretty nice. But yes, Brendan, we appreciate the feedback. Always appreciated. If you have any feedback, like Brendan, or a question, or anything that we talk about on the show, or might talk about in a future show, send us an email. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We also want to shout out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. We do it every day, and today they include Steve Iadarola, Chris Allen, and Mike Akins. Richard Gunther, so nice to have you back on the show. Hope CES, the remote version of CES anyway, was kind to you. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Yeah, absolutely. I'm the editor out at the Digital Media Zone, 
That's the digitalmediazone.com. And you can catch the shows I do, Home On, which is about DIY smart home, and The Smart Home Show, which is about smart home industry stuff, all in your favorite podcatchers. Very good, very good. Uh, Scott Johnson, thanks for being with us as well. Uh, as always, you you uh, I don't even know how you juggle all the things that you do, but let us know a couple of places people can keep up with them. I don't know either, but there are places to go to get it. Uh, for example, if you go to frogpants.com, you'll find a podcast page that has a whole slew of podcasts that happen every week. If you heard me talking about games today and you're like, ooh, I want more of that, there's a show on there called Core, which we do every Wednesday night, excuse me, Thursdays now. Um, you can find the schedule for when that happens live or get it on the podcast and find out more about what I think about this Ubisoft news as well as that Indiana Jones game. Uh, again, that's frogpants.com slash podcast. And for everything else, you can find me over on Twitter at Scott Johnson. Would you like a DTNS hat or a hoodie or a mask or a mouse pad? We got it all. Uh, it's right there at the dailytechnewsshow.com store, which you get to by going to dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. If you've never joined us live and you'd like to, give it a shot. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash live is where to find out more. And we are back tomorrow. Back at it. Just about to talk to them. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at FrogPants.com. Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs>